There we go. Hello, <laughs> and welcome to the second meeting of the Top Shelf Society. This is going to be an exciting one. We have picked a really deep and I think beautiful book to talk about. So we are discussing Black Girl Unlimited by Echo Brown. And um, before we get started in the discussion, I think that in the beginning, we kind of just need to talk about our August, no, July <laughs> book. So we're going to be doing Secret Garden in July, and that will be on July 25th, uh, Saturday at 5 p.m. So make sure that you get your copy of Secret Garden so you can get started with that. And now we'll go ahead and do introductions. So I'll start off. I'm Kristen from Perks of a Book Flower, and uh, I mainly read like literary and YA fiction, contemporary. That's me. Oh my, okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Hi, my name is Isenia. I'm from the channel Isenia, just easy, my first name. Um, I read a lot of YA, but I also toss in some middle grade and then some contemporary romance. So, yeah, that's what I do. L. Hi, so uh, I'm L, and I'm from Lovely Reads 101. I am in a long-term relationship with YA Contemporary. That's pretty much like all I read, but I'm trying to branch out of that, which I'm failing at miserably, so yeah. <laughs> my name is Angela. My channel is Angela Rose Reads, and I honestly pretty much read anything. I like to usually have a nonfiction and a fiction, and I like magical realism a lot, so that was wonderful for this book. <laughs> yeah. Sarah. Um, and I'm Sarah. Um, I have a booktube channel called Sarah's Reading Nook, and I like to read a lot of nonfiction. Um, I'm a scientist, so nonfiction is sort of like my thing. And then I like to put in some fiction, poetry, um, and memoirs and autobiographies. Nice. And I read my, with my cat. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Olivia. <laughs> okay, so. To begin, um, we wanted, as a lot of you probably know, whether you're watching this with us live now or if you catch it kind of later on, we had originally chosen to do Secret Garden in June, but we decided that we really wanted to amplify Black voices, and so we switched to, um, to this book, to Black Girl Unlimited, which we are so excited to be talking about. And we listed Black Lives Matter resources kind of in the description box below, so we have like a one master link that if you go to it there are places where you can sign positions where you can donate all of that and then there's also a link to some black booktubers that you can follow and start subscribing to and engaging with and l's youtube channel <laughs> is um the first thing you're going to see in the comments below make sure you subscribe to l right now she's so funny so full of life i mean you're going to see that but i love her <laughs> and um and then one more thing, <laughs> sorry, and then we'll get started. Um, but that's just the fact that me, Angela, and Sarah, we're white. And Yesenia is a, like a person of color, and so is Elle, but only Elle is black. So whenever we're talking about the book, we are only Elle will be able to kind of give any feedback onto the representation of black struggles and black people in this book. So the rest of us, we're just going to only be able to talk about what we as readers are knowledgeable of which is going to be things like um, plot points and theme and things like that. So with all that being said, let's start off with a synopsis. Isenia? Okay, so whatever synopsis I give, I'm just gonna go out and say, it's not gonna do the story justice because this is just such an impactful story that whether, while it is short, it packs such a punch and talks about so many topics ranging from poverty, to racism, to sexual assault, to drug abuse, um, and sexism as well. So in this story, we follow Echo Brown, which this is, it's infused with magical realism, but it's autobiographical as well. Um, and we follow her from the age of six all the way to early adulthood and graduating high school and how she kind of um, becomes a wizard in a sense of overcoming all of these struggles that she faces. So that's like the briefest of synopses I can give. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to add on to that or. Yeah, no, I think you covered it. <laughs> um, so we're obviously going to get very deep into this discussion, but I thought a good way to just kind of get some more like synopsis information out 
would be to like maybe list or talk about one of our favorite aspects of the book. Um, so I'll go first. And that for me is going to be like how the book is written. Like it's framed in this way, like Echo Brown does this beautiful thing where she'll be, there'll be one aspect of Echo's life. And then there will be another one that's similar. That's kind of, um, there will be like these dashes that connect them, but the scenes are two scenes that are different, but going on at the same time. And it's such a powerful way to tell a story. Like I've never seen anything like it. And there's this one part of the book near the end where um, Echo is giving a graduation speech. And then that graduation speech is also being like, at the same time interspersed with this scene um, where she's in church <laughs> and the content goes so well together. It's so artistic. Um, I don't know, what did you guys, did you notice that? Yeah, that was one of my um, favorite scenes of the novel. And then I was, um, I know I mentioned it before we went live, but I listened to the audiobook as well, which is narrated by Echo Brown herself and the way that that's infused not only on the page, but within the audiobook is incredible. Yeah. Can I ask as, as someone who listened to the audiobook, because in the pages, when, because that happens a couple of times, there's like these little lines. Uh, I don't know if I can show that very well, but there's like these little lines that mm -hmm. separate and show you that, okay, they're switching to something else. In the audiobook, was that confusing for you, or was it? Did you know that they were switching to something else? Or I, I, I kind of knew because she didn't. It's not like she did individual voices for all of the characters within the book, but she did change her um, her cadence and then her tone as well. So it was easy to follow. But I would recommend if you're somebody that speeds up the audiobook to not because I could see how that could be missed if you were to speed it up, but. Um, I think I listened to it on like 1.2 speed or something and it, it worked really well. Yeah. Have you guys ever seen anything done like that in a book before where it's, I don't know, it like it just made it so much more powerful. I've seen it in a couple different contemporaries, but not in that specific way. Like the way she connects a memory to a current scene is actually very, very unique and it was really cool. So that's something, that's an aspect that I definitely enjoyed about it. But I think my favorite thing about the book was how she kind of took her own experiences and made it broad enough for other people to understand. Like she wrote the book in a way where even if you're if you're not black, you can still quite clearly understand what's going on and that it's impactful and that a lot of it's really, really hurtful. So I that was definitely my favorite aspect of it. Yes. Anyone else have a favorite aspect? I I definitely to agree with what Elle said. I liked how, um, I also didn't like, cause obviously there's a lot of struggles and it's really sad that everyone can in some ways relate to a lot of these life problems. But I thought that my favorite part was the magical realist idea of being able to see the black veil versus the light in people. Mm -hmm. And when Echo is at school and she does that and turns it on and she can see black veils almost coming over almost everyone. And it just breaks my heart that, especially how a lot of this book is written when she was a child and growing up and that so many children struggle with all of these things. Like children should be the ones that we protect and take care of. And sadly, uh, that's not always what happens. And I thought it was really powerful how, um, that ability to be able to see other people's struggles, but then also to be able to see the light and try to help keep that veil off and try to focus on the light. I thought that was so powerful, yeah. Yeah, Angela, I completely agree. And um, the black veil was something I feel like I related a lot to as well. And now it, it's kind of changed a little bit how I see the world, I guess, because I, I kind of imagine like the black veils over everyone, you know, and like, how that affects even your everyday actions. And like, that's a common thought to have, you know, like if you always hear, you know, everyone has their own struggles, but now it's like something I can almost imagine visually, like people's mm -hmm. black veils hanging over them. And then like the miracle, like the power of like people coming together and how you can help keep people from going in to the black veil because Echo, there's that, that one scene where 
it's like a neighbor and her mom and they mm -hmm. all like work together to keep her from going over like into like succumbing to the black veil forever it's so powerful and that's part of our notes that that we're going to get to so i'm glad that you've brought that up now Sierra? Um, my favorite aspect was uh actually the complexities of the relationships that were um, within the book, like her complicated relationship with her mother, for instance, that was such a, sh oh my gosh, her mm -hmm. ability to forgive her, her compassion for her mother, um, her how she found that her mother was both inspirational and also highly conflicted. Um, that was a very deep sort of meaningful relationship that um, I was like, wow, <laughs> I I, it was it was really like outstanding. Yeah. Okay. So now, um, whether you're watching it live or later, like hopefully you've gotten more of an idea of what this book is. But even if we talk about it for hours, I don't think that we would even slightly peel back the layers. Like it truly is something that I think that you should just stop what you're doing and buy right now because yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> I'm kind of giving away the answer. Is this a top shelf read? But I just can't help it. <laughs> um, so and Bridge that, M Books has another uh, magical realist thing that they really enjoyed. Oh, okay, um, good. Let's see. I also love the idea of planting good seeds in others and believing that others can change for the better. Yeah, definitely. Um, so why don't we just go ahead and let that lead us in to our discussion on magical realism as a genre. So whenever I got this book, I didn't know anything about it but um, i think it was some of i think it may have been sarah who told me that it was magical realism and then i had heard it was like part partly memoir so like it has a lot of things going on um but the magical realism is so strong and so nicely done um so basically to define magical realism it's just like little bits of magic that are mostly sprinkled into a contemporary setting it's nothing on the same level as like a fantasy where you've got this world building. Um, it's more along the lines, you could say, of urban fantasy and the fact that it's just magic existing in our everyday world. Um, and it's weaved so seamlessly into the story. Um, so let's talk about what you guys thought about the magical realism elements in the story. Like what were your favorites? What do you think worked really well? What do you think? Well, this I is already my said my <laughs> Sorry, I jumped the gun and said it in the earlier favorite part of the book. <laughs> the first big thing is the fact that like Echo was a witch, <laughs> or no, a wizard. Mm -hmm. Excuse <laughs> me, sorry. It's a wizard, which is so much cooler. Um, and so it, in the book, it follows Echo like in the process of learning about the magic and discovering it, um, which I think is really powerful. I think um, I actually got a little bit confused when I first started reading it because I went into it thinking that it was magical realism, but then there were scenes in the beginning of the book where she would say that like it's her mom being like wizardly like and creating these miracles, but then in the back of my head I'm like that wasn't a miracle that she created. Like the one scene that comes to mind is um when her and her brothers are sitting at the table and they're hungry and like there's really no food for them and their mom gets in a car with a man goes away for a couple hours, comes back and has food. And Echo perceives that to be a miracle. And I was like, oh, sweetie. But then <laughs> I realized that, okay, it is a magical realism book. But I also like that she was able to preserve the innocence of a child in that aspect as well. Like you don't actually, she doesn't actually know what happened until much later. So it, it did throw me for a loop for a second. Cause I was like, is this actually magical realism or is it just a naive child? But I figured that out later. <laughs> Yeah, um, because eventually Echo starts doing things like being able to freeze time a yeah. little bit to make things happen. Or like one of my other favorite scenes in uh, the book, whenever they're watching Titanic. Yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> that was so wow. cool. So they, they make um, Leo and Kate in mm -hmm. like the Titanic scene when they're about to uh, like when Leo Leonardo DiCaprio is about to sink into the ocean. Instead, he like gets up and talks to Echo's brothers to like encourage them like to kind of go on a different path with their life. Right. So cool. I love that scene too. Even That's her so friend's cool. mom. Yeah, too. Same. 
because her yeah. friend's mom was very restrictive in what she allowed her to do. And even her, they were talking about afterwards, she was a little changed as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was really good. Yeah. Any other aspects you guys liked about the magical realism? Um, this one was my first experience with magical realism, just in general. So I kind of didn't Whoa. know what to expect going into it. Mm -hmm. So that was fun. But I think my, it's kind of a more, it's not a specific scene, but it's just the overall story itself. I really love how she kept referring to herself and her mother and her female friends as wizards because that that's a word that holds so much power and they're put in all of these situations that are meant to make them feel powerless. So I thought that in and of itself was really great symbolism. Just you can kind of overcome everything if you just keep pushing through and keep pulling that black veil back and off of you. So yeah, that was my favorite part of it. Mm -hmm. I have a Can I, I have a question. Okay. Why do you think she used the word wizard instead of witch? Ooh. I kept thinking about it when I was reading the book. Maybe yeah. it's more gender neutral because it's not just the females, perhaps, maybe? I don't know. I'm not sure because I always think back to vampire diaries and there was male witches in vampire diaries as well. So oh, I was like, uh -huh. I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. Well, that's why I was going to ask a question similar in the same vein is, um, I did, did Echo Brown become like um, some type of therapist for young girls? Is that like, because this seems very almost written chapter by chapter, like things that you should do to try to get yourself out of a, bad mental state so you don't like succumb to the difficulties of life mm -hmm. and like I guess that was just the same similar to Sarah like the choices of how she wrote the book it was literally almost like a guide that you would give to mm -hmm. a teenager or a young adult and it's like does anybody know did she actually do that or is this just like something that actually people could utilize as that so I did some research um on Echo and she has uh like several TED talks so she actually, she did go to Dartmouth and she was accepted to every uh, university that she applied to. Um, and she had a like one woman show. I forget what it was called, like black virgins um, or don't date his hipsters or something like that. I forget exactly what the name was, but it was hilarious. And so, but very powerful at the same time. And she even talked about when she wrote it, um, she would have these incredibly like deep, intense moments. And then she would have levity like interspersed throughout. So she toured um, the US and she actually even toured Europe. Um, I think she went to Germany for sure um, and gave talks there as well. So she um, sort of spent like several years doing these talks. She went on to do um, journalism. She was an investigative journalist for a while. Um, and um, afterwards she lived in, um, I think it was California. I have no idea where Dartmouth is. Like, I, <laughs> I, I don't know. I hear these words like Dartmouth, Yale, Harvard, and I'm like, that's somewhere in the US. <laughs> and that's about all I know. Um, but yeah, she has like an insane like CV and like resume. So maybe that's part of the levity of adding to it. I know it's magical realism, but mm -hmm. you know, like, like Elle was saying, it almost kind of makes it a little less uh, scary and impactful if you kind of have that element of like, okay, they're a wizard, they're learning how to handle it or something. Maybe that's part of trying to add in a little bit of levity to such a, this is a really very heavy, um, a lot of subjects like you were saying. So, I um, don't <laughs> <laughs> This might be reaching, I'm not sure, but um, one of the discussions that she kind of delved into was sexism. So I kind of even mm -hmm. wonder if the difference between wizard and a witch, wizards are typically male mm -hmm. characters, and witches are typically female. So I wonder if that was even a slight nod to, we are equal, we should be treated equal in all of our problems. That's what I think it was. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So that's yeah. what I, after kind of reading the whole book, that's kind of what I took away, but sure. I also don't know if that's like a reach or not. No, that makes sense, definitely. Mm -hmm.
Um, so just while we're on the topic of magical realism, maybe we could give like some recommendations. If you have read like a magical realism book, is there one that you really enjoyed? Um, so I'll start off my favorite magical realism book, um, besides this one, is The Snow Child by Ewan Ivy. Have mm -hmm. any of you heard of it? No, no, but I watched it on my Goodreads. <laughs> is, that, is, is, it, is it a middle grade? No, not? no, it's kind of like a literary fiction, um, but it's like the story, it's like they make this kid into snow and then the, the snow kid like comes to life and it's a family that hasn't ever been able to have kids. It's so beautiful. Any other ones? I'm looking for, because <laughs> I read a lot and sometimes it blends together if it's going to be fantasy or magical realism. Also, um, go oh, ahead. <laughs> sorry, I was going to say, I think the only other magical realism book that I've read was The Price Guide to the Occult. Yeah. Um, that one was really, really good. A, a lot happened in it. And I, <laughs> I know that um, it takes place on like an island in the middle of the U.S. somewhere, but it was really cool. So I'm very, it's kind of what happens when um this girl starts selling spells through a youtube channel or something along those lines and it was just it was funny but it was also very cool so yes that book is by um i believe the same author who wrote the strange and beautiful sorrows yes, of right. ava lavender yes yes, mm -hmm. yes. okay uh, this is also an amazing book i don't know what it is about magical realism books but i think it's just like that extra little bit of like playing around with modern life and adding in something special like in this case ava lavender has wings and that's kind of the only magical element that you see but it makes the story so much more interesting and layered and yeah, I think that's why magical realism stories always end up being so good and so memorable is because they always have like that one element, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah. What's interesting is that I was looking at like reviews of the book and the only negative reviews that I saw um, had to do with the magical realism aspect. And I thought that was interesting because in my mind, I thought that magical realism added so much to the entire book. Like, I think that it um, it was really captivated or captivating and like really well interwoven, like throughout the story. Um, yeah, so I had like I was thinking of a question, which is, do you think that magical realism like was necessary or like added significantly to the story? I Because I definitely do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that magical realism element in this story was able to show, going off of what Angela said, not really bringing levity, but bringing like, it's like a metaphor that makes it easier to see. Like powerful what, imagery almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it, it is about like dealing with the chaos of life and like showing it as the black veil makes it something that you can visualize. And then um, whenever you're thinking about the in-between and how it's like all golden and a, a happy place or whatever, like that makes it more visible too. It's like why we use metaphors to make these abstract ideas more understandable. And I think that using like the magic kind of made all the pain and um, dealing with it and processing it more visual. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> I think if the magical realism wasn't there, it'd be a completely different book because then it kind of changes how broad the experience is and who can really grasp how um, intense it is in some points. Like if the magical realism isn't there, then the relationship with her friend Elena wouldn't be as strong because they that's what they really bond over is both of them being wizards. So then you would lose that aspect and then you wouldn't really be able to get the full clarity of the relationship with her mom because like they wouldn't be able to bond over that as well so it'd be a completely different story i think a lot of the impactfulness would have been lost if it wasn't a magical realism i completely agree, I agree. Oh, yeah i agree with that as well and um too i think that um i don't know if you if any of you have ever experienced like dissociation before but um i feel like the magical realism did a very good job of sort of um, showing or illustrating how dissociation due to tra past trauma or how depression manifests um, and how one sort of can get through those moments.
by almost being like um like (laughs) up on the ceiling watching it as it's happening Mm -hmm. yeah and that that's like that was very powerful Mm -hmm. and that's the thing i'm talking about like instead of saying you know like i disassociated completely in the book instead she's floating on the ceiling making that whole like psychological process visual visual you know Mm -hmm. like you can floating on the ceiling makes so much sense for what that's like uh yeah how do you feel about the ceremony that they would perform? Do you think that that was a literal type of ceremony or do you think it was a type of magical realist thing where the women that came to help did help guide her, but do you think it was actually something going on? Like, do you know what I'm saying? Like um, how you're talking about, instead of saying, okay, you're disassociating, you're doing this. Do you think the ceremony was something else going on or do you think it was more just take it as it was, it really was a ceremony? Because <laughs> I think it happened twice with uh, Echo's mom and then when she was younger and then with her. Um, yeah. So I, I think it's like a representation of the power of unity, right? Mm-hmm. So because they, they come together and in that one particular instance, they're able to um, bring Echo back from like going into the Black Veil forever. Mm-hmm. And so I think those ceremonies where they like um, speak phrases over and over and they all come together is kind of like the power of like having a strong community with you can help you like not go into depression or the black veil or just a spiral of mental health issues, whatever, you know? Right. The ceremony was a really powerful um, sort of element in the two times, right? Because Mm -hmm. they had drastically different outcomes. Mm -hmm. Um, The outcome for her mother and the outcome for um, Echo were like so different. And that was one of the moments where you realize what Echo's mom had done. Um, I had to, I put down the book and I was like, I know. I couldn't handle it for like a day. (laughs) (laughs) After, after. (laughs) (laughs) yeah. Okay, let's see if we touched on all our points we wanted to about magical realism. Um, I think so. All right, so now we were going to talk a little bit about teachers because Miss Delaney and teachers play a really big role in Echo's life. So, uh, Sarah, do you want to lead us into that discussion? Sure. Um, so, Mrs. Delaney was really like influential in Echo's life. She supported her like academically, praised her achievements, encouraged her, listened to her, had her open up to her and also expanded on Echo's knowledge base and framework of wizardry, which I totally was not expecting. I was not expecting her to be a wizard. (laughs) So I was a little shocked when I saw that. Um, And then even when life was really hard for Echo, she, um, like Echo wrote a poem and uh, Mrs. Delaney sort of uh, almost, it seemed like she was becoming distant from Echo, but really she was, kind of internally sort of processing, how do I um, offer Echo a place at my home, right? Um, how, do, how, how do I let her stay in my home? How do I offer it to her? Um, so I'm just going to ask you guys, how was Mrs. Delaney important in Echo's life? Well, it, so she's kind of like a bridge. Like she was able to help take echo out of her home life where there was just so much going on but i feel like it was really complicated you know for echo to do that like she didn't want to leave her brothers she felt all of this guilt and then especially when her mom ended up in the hospital again like after all of that it was just like amplified um but i think that in it you kind of see how desperate Echo's situation at home had become because like you can tell she loves her brothers with all of her soul. So the fact that she had to make that decision to to live with Miss Delaney, like I think it just shows like the the wear and the exhaustion and, and how it was really affecting Echo to do that. So like desperation and like inner turmoil about the decision and the, mm-hmm. the potential consequences to her family. Mm-hmm. I think Miss Laney 
showed Echo how to put herself first because had Echo probably had it her way, she more than likely would have stayed um, for the sake of her brothers because of how much she loves them. But I think that's where Miss Lainey really stepped in and helped her like push her forward and be like, no, like you have to think of yourself first here, help yourself and then you can go back and help them type of situation. And I really valued that a lot. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. Oh, we lost Angela. Yes, we did. Oh no. <laughs> um, <laughs> And we, it makes me think about Echo's, um, she had a teacher when she was younger, too, mm -hmm. and, and she would, they would, like, spin on the carpet and, like, make dreams, and, and that was really important in Echo's life as well, because I feel like once she realized she had grown up was whenever she realized that she, she couldn't, like, those dreams weren't real anymore. Like, like the carpet know? was gone type of yeah. thing. Yeah. That, like I loved her kindergarten teacher. I'm a Sunday school teacher. So she, that teacher resonated so much with me because we do exercises like that all the time at school that like, or at church really, that yeah. kind of foster imagination and kind of like just drag it out of kids. And it's so much fun to hear what goes on in their little minds. And you realize that they're actually, they can contemplate so much more than what we actually think. And it was just, it was a nice scene. It was a nice moment for me. Yeah. Um, it's funny because I'm a teacher and so I, I teach sixth grade right now. A lot of that joy and dreamingness is kind of going out of them at that point. And then I've also taught 11th and 12th grade as well. And at that point, students are so disillusioned. It's just sad to think of those like little bright rays of sunshine, you know, in kindergarten and in Sunday school. And how even if you don't have an experience like Echoes, that's still like life just kind of can suck that little optimism fantasy out of you. How long have you been a teacher? I'm sorry. I thought you were like 20. How long have you been a teacher? <laughs> uh, this is my first year. I graduated Yay. college last year, but I'm 23. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. I look 12 a lot though. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so my friend Leanne brought up a good point and I'm going to put it up on here. Um, she said, I really think Mrs. D was also complicit in some of her husband's poor treatment of Echo. And this made me think a lot about how we can all be complicit and how this is unacceptable. What do you think about that? That was one thing that really stuck out to me. Like, I do think that she represented hope for Echo as well as, um, like Elle said, like having to put herself first to help the others around her. But um, yeah, I definitely that I completely agree with Leanne. I think that that really did open up the discussion on how like complicit you can be in your own personal bubble and your own personal family, but then kind of more active outside of it. So um, yeah, I don't know if any of you have more to say about that, but I do think that was, it, it was good for her to show both sides of the spectrum from this character and show that she did have a flaw or flaws because she did. I was going to say it, it was nice to see that. I mean, it wasn't nice because I, I kind of just wanted Miss Delaney to just be like the overall hero of the story, which is just not realistic in the mm -hmm. real world at all. So, but then it also made me think, I think it was Malcolm X who said like the most disrespected person in America is the black woman. And it just, it showed me that like Echo just could not catch a break no matter where she was or what she was doing. She just couldn't catch a break. And that just kind of solidified that quote for me. So, which is really sad. Yeah, no, I agree. Hey, Angela. Sorry, my Wi-Fi went off. No problem. We're actually just having a really um, interesting discussion and we'd love to hear your thoughts too on this. Um, so I'll read the comment again. I really think Mrs. Delaney was also complicit in some of her husband's poor treatment of Echo. And this made me think a lot about how we can all be complicit and how this is unacceptable. Yes, I agree. Um, I, I know that Echo listened to her have a conversation with him one night where she pointed out what he was doing that he wasn't realizing. But I feel like that should have taken place a lot earlier. Yeah. <laughs> so that, cause like once the damage is done, it's done. It's really hard to, you can forgive cause I know he apologized, but you, he still made her feel that way. And um, I'm definitely one who, I don't care if you're my family. I don't care if you're my spouse. I don't care who you are. If you're hurting someone else, even if you're not intending to, 
it needs to be brought to your attention. So, yeah, I don't know. I'm so sorry. I missed. I don't know what anyone else said, but I, <laughs> that's how I feel. No, I think you're right. That was something that bothered mm -hmm. me a lot too. I was like, why is Miss Delaney not like stepping up? Like mm -hmm. Echo was like in pain here. And she already, Echo already had like all of these bad feelings towards men, you know, because like the men in her life had just like been awful. And like, that was something that I related so much to was like the trauma that men can cause women. Mm -hmm. And so whenever she got into this situation, I was like, dang it. Like I thought Echo was going to get a break, but now there's this too. It feel, just feels like a like struggle. I mean, they just never ended. The one thing I was going to bring up, I was looking for it, um, that we were talking about what impact we think Miss Delaney had on Echo. And the one mm -hmm. thing that Echo has repeated a couple of times, again, I'm so sorry if somebody else already said this and I was not here. Um, but when Echo was saying she wasn't going to speak her poem and Miss Delaney was like, okay, I understand you're afraid, but um, if you keep yourself hidden, we all lose, the world won't have you and all the incredible gifts you possess. And like a couple of times later, Echo kept reminding that, like the world won't have me if I don't be myself. And so I think that at least that was something that was profound that she gave Echo a point of view that helped her. So that's one thing, but that doesn't again, make up for not addressing her husband's issues earlier, but yeah. <laughs> Um, so now I have a question. So um, since we're talking about teachers, are there any teachers who were important in your life? Um, yeah, so I think that that's a good question because it, it really goes back to like how influential teachers can be. Like I had a teacher who was not a good teacher mm -hmm. and, and that made me want to be a teacher because I could see not only like the emotional damage that that teacher was causing like other students in my class, but also like how much we weren't learning. And like, honestly, class felt like a waste. And, and so I was like, I was like, I can do better than this. And I should. And um, I think that having a bad teacher can be just as, I don't know, powerful but there's really nothing like having a good teacher, like the, especially when you're a kid, you know, because you're just looking for someone to validate you and see something in you and bring it out in you. And yeah, so I had a bad teacher, but what about you guys? <laughs> I was raising your hand. <laughs> I said you were raising your hand. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I completely agree with you, Kristen, with, um, how impactful a bad teacher can be. And it's actually really sad because I had an elementary school teacher who actually flat out called me stupid while we were in, in French class. And from that day on, I remember it so clearly, I have never wanted to learn French since that day. It's a language that I've just, I, as soon as I got to high school, I switched to Spanish because I didn't want to deal with it. I never wanted to be embarrassed like that again. But on, on the same note, I had a history teacher in high school that instilled my love of history and made me become a history minor because of it. So. It's definitely a balancing act. And I think people underestimate one, how important teachers are and how scary a bad teacher can be. Yeah. Like, you, like we were saying before, the damage is done. Like mm -hmm. she might not have even, or I don't know if it was a male or female, but might not have even gave a second thought and might not have intended that, but that still mm -hmm. hurt you. And now you can't get rid of that. Like that's, I'm, I'm studying to be a teacher and that's something I'm honestly terrified about because like, I know I, I'm, you know, making sure that I have the best, I, I think about what I say before I say it and things like that. But I'm just scared that like someone might take something the wrong way and then I like hurt them forever. Like that just devastates me. So like, that's scary, but yeah, <laughs> hopefully like, I guess that's why I love reading so much and especially like reading other people's points of views and other people who have had life experiences that you haven't because it lets you kind of get a little more of an understanding about how impactful something that you think could be innocent might actually be. And that's why it's important to like call each other out and hold each other accountable for what we say to each other. Yeah, I agree so much with that. It's like, it goes kind of back to just the power of words in general but they seem to be more powerful when they come out of the teacher's mouth mm -hmm. because that's your yeah. authority, you know? And, and 
it's just it's such a fragile kind of relationship especially when you're young so i'm glad that echo had a miss delaney even though miss delaney clearly had her faults um but i just really love that kindergarten teacher encouraging those kids to spin and dream yeah <laughs> yeah i remember i took a i took an ecology class I think it was in my first or second year of university and I did really bad on one of my exams and later on went on to talk to uh, the professor at the time and he was like, oh, I remembered your test. I didn't even think you were taking it seriously when you wrote it, you did so bad. And so he told me that I should quit my degree and that I wasn't smart enough to do science. So I was very happy when on the gra on graduation day, I saw him in the front row and I was like, mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. I, Good for I, you. <laughs> so I was, I was uh, sometimes like, I, I've had very good teachers. And in high school, I remember I would like hang out with them after school because I thought they were more cool than the kids. Um, <laughs> really um and we would just like laugh and that sort of thing um but yeah sometimes too like experiences with bad teachers have really like inspired me to be like screw you <laughs> yeah to gr like grow a backbone and become stronger because of it mm -hmm. uh-huh yeah i like it when I was younger, if I had a teacher that did that, it would just destroy me. So um, it, the impact of teachers, especially when you're so young and like in kindergarten or first, second, third grade, you have such an important role. Like it's insane. Yeah. Like they'll okay. remember for the rest of their life. <laughs> So um, just for the sake of time, we're probably going to move on to our next segment now. So we're still going to discuss miracles, mothers, and is this a top shelf read before we go on to our conclusions. And so I'm going to lead the discussion on miracles. And I think that when we're like talking about miracles, the biggest thing that sticks out to me is like the black veil and how we can get rid of the black veil. So, um, We've talked a little bit about the black veil already, um, but what do you guys like think about the importance of the black veil and how do we see the black veil being used in the story? I forget who said it earlier, but it's kind of like a connector. It kind of shows like a similarity between everybody regardless of like race or gender or anything like that. So I think it was so important to have that to be able to kind of, like I said earlier, broaden the experience for everyone because it just kind of showed that even if you don't know directly what someone else is struggling with, that black veil shows that they are struggling with something. And that's kind of an equalizer, like an equal playing field for everyone. Mm -hmm. And so if you um, are watching this and you haven't read the book, the black veil is basically like, it would be like a metaphor for kind of like depression, but also more than that, it's like the heaviness of life that hangs mm -hmm. over you and brings you down. I would say that's probably more accurately what it is. Um, and there's lots of points, well, at least two that I can think of in the book where women like band together to help keep someone from going into the black veil and like losing themselves forever into it. Um, and like the miracle is what happens whenever the women bond together and like speak good things and come together to keep someone from going into the black veil. Um, so how do you think that this could like work in real life too? Like, have you ever, I don't know, been in a situation or something where like coming together has like helped you with your black veil or anything like that? That's kind of a deep question, but if anyone wants to share. <laughs> I think I just try to keep it. No, you go. Oh, I've I talked more than you. I want you to go. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. I was going to say, well, I think we all like have had situations like that to where it's not necessarily like a big group of people or anything. It could be yourself doing it for, for you. It could be your mom, the best friend, whatever. But um, yeah, so I'd say that we 
deep down, I think that everyone has had a situation with a black veil type thing, no matter how big or small. Yeah. What are you going to say, Angela? Similar, just, just like, it's more of a mental thing, like how she mentally switches it to see the light or the veil. Like you, I feel like um, just mentally when you're really upset at someone or, or you don't understand someone realizing that they're a human too and they've had their own experiences that would be traumatic and they've had their own lives and more just like trying to understand that everyone's human and they have their own struggles. So even if you don't understand, that's what they've had to deal with, you know? And I, I have anxiety. Um, and so like it, I get in these like thought spirals that sometimes they'll like just start manifesting as panic attacks. And my mom is someone who will break through that black veil for me. Like um, just talking to her or calling the phone or like her, me going over to see her is, is like a miracle in itself. I feel like the fact that anyone can get me out of that thought spiral. So I think we all have like our, our miracle people who help us so much. <laughs> um, and, and so this got me thinking though, because I feel like miracles in this story are not like the traditional miracles when you think of like biblically or in people's like religions, like where miracles are like acts of God that like come from above. It To me, it looks like the people are the ones like making the miracles happen themselves like they're doing it with their own power. And so one of my questions was just um, like, do you believe in miracles or do you think that miracles are something that you kind of have to make happen yourself or both? <laughs> what do you think? Well, that's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> um, or maybe just in the book, like what do you, do you agree that miracles are something they make happen? Like, I think that it's it's a little bit of both, right? So you you make the miracles for yourself, but then you can flip the script and just say, it's a miracle that you can go through so much, you can endure so much, and every day you wake up and you keep pushing through. Like that in itself is a miracle. So mm -hmm. yeah, just like the amount that a human can endure, especially specifically Echo Brown, the amount that she has in, endured of just all of these different things that have been thrown at her all her life. Um, I would say that that's, you could take a miracle for what it is, but um, yeah, I'd say that that's a miracle in and of itself. I liked the idea of miracles being something small and not necessarily like, like you were saying earlier, like this huge biblical act, like the idea of that you can make your own miracles. I definitely would be able to subscribe to that. Yeah, me too. So like, I, I do believe in miracles, but I think that in the day to day, like there is this like power in the fact that we can also make our own miracles, you know, like we can also help keep our brothers from going into the black veil. Maybe we can't make Kate and Leo like talk in the Titanic movie, <laughs> but like there are other things, like you can have conversations and that like, changing someone's life to keep them from going down like a dark path is a miracle. We just don't call it that. Um, oh, there's one scene. Sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. No, it's okay. There's one scene where I kind of thought of it as like a small miracle and it's where Echo kind of gets jumped by Tiffany and her friends, but Tiffany just kind of stands to the back and doesn't really say or do anything until Echo like screams for her help. And she's like, we're sisters, like, like help me type of thing. And from that day forward, Tiffany says later on that like she's felt better about because she did break it up and help Echo and she's felt better since then and she hasn't felt so angry and I think that in itself was a small miracle there and that just that quick act of her not necessarily condemning Tiffany and you know yelling and saying all the nasty things that were being said to her but just simply asking for help and saying you know like we're equal on this as well like help me that was definitely a small miracle at least in my eyes. Mm -hmm. I agree, Elle. And like just the power of a word or helping someone mm -hmm. can be a miracle. And then reaching out too, like even though we've talked about Miss Delaney and her problems, I think that mm -hmm. like intervening and helping Elle at least like our new Echo um, see the power, sorry, I think about what you said, um, mm -hmm. a teacher to, um, to help her get out of that situation. Like people, when they reach into your life and help you, that's a miracle too. Mm -hmm. I think, I think on the flip side, a big one. Oh, go ahead. 
Oh, um, I think that like a, a larger miracle, of course, was uh, Elle's mother. And um, after her overdose, Echo. Um, Echo. Or, sorry, Echo. <laughs> <laughs> after, We're all still sorry. thinking about how good that last moment was. You said. We're all just mesmerized. <laughs> okay, so after Echo's mom overdoses and um, she goes into the, like, what is it, like the in between or something like that? Mm -hmm. And then afterwards um, is revived uh, and goes on to AA. Yeah, so, okay, mm -hmm. I- And changes I, her ways. Huh? And changes. Yeah. So yeah. is the in between, that was a good thing, right? Like it was, or was it a bad thing? I can't remember. It, I think it was like your deciding factor. Like you can, like the in between is where you can choose to either go back and change your ways or go forward into the black veil. That's kind of how I saw it. But yeah. in, in terms yeah. of the actual story itself, I think the in between was a great aspect of it because that's mm -hmm. where um, Echo's mom got her forgiveness from her mm -hmm. own mother for everything that had transpired yeah. early mm -hmm. in her life. So I think that yeah it's kind of where you decide whether or not you're going to change your ways or push through or keep staying how you are but in terms of the actual story i'd say it was a pretty positive um place i mm -hmm. love that because in a way my whole early 20s i feel like i've been in my own kind of in between mm -hmm. where it's like not making decisions about like the state of my soul but like this, I think we can all relate to like having to make decisions that affect the course of your life, especially like at the age that most of us are at, like career choices and places we live, like they all feel like big decisions. And like, I just constantly feel like I'm in my own in between. I don't know if you can relate, but mm -hmm. yeah. Um, also, we have this comment here. Yeah. Which is good. Um, yeah, so Bridge says, yes, I agree. I also like the idea of finding your own strength. Sometimes, at least for me, I feel like it's easy to forget my own strength and give the veil control. Yeah, so that goes back to like, we can make our own miracles and be the strong ones. And um, sometimes, like with the help of others, we can keep from going into the veil. Okay. Oh my gosh, can you hear my dog? Oh, <laughs> I love it. I thought it was my dog for a second. <laughs> I low key thought it was my stomach growling, but <laughs> I'm glad it was your dog. <laughs> um. Okay. Let me see. Can I ask you a question real quick, though? Just to because I'm because like I said, I'm very adamant about that people need to listen to everyone and like people need to learn from everyone's experiences, and so. Like we were saying at the beginning, for three of us here, we don't have a lot of perspective on a lot of what happens in the book of what Echo's life is like. And I think that the brilliant thing that we've addressed already is that it applies, so many of the things that happen apply to everyone. And that's brilliant and incredible that everyone can connect to it. But just in like, I think it's also important, can I ask, and I don't want to put you on the spot and you can say no if you don't have anything to say, but like for the people of color that have read this book, Ellen Isenia, is there anything in particular that stood out to you that we might not have noticed or that you really connected to or you thought that like, you know, you wish more people understood this or you felt understood? Like, I just, I just kind of like want to hear your thoughts overall about Echo's life and if anything mirrored or anything is, imp you know what I'm saying? Like, I just want to, I just want to see because I we I come from a place of ignorance because I can't possibly understand. So I just want to listen if there's anything that you'd want to talk about. Oh, so <laughs> yeah, that's what, that's what I want to hear. Yeah. I want to hear what you have to say yeah. about it. All. Yeah, that's, me too. Um, okay, so one of the first things that stood out for me was the internal conflict that she has with her hair. Um, and that's something that like resonated with me on such a deep level because growing up, especially when you're a dark skinned black person, the fight with your hair, especially when you're a dark skinned black female, the fight with your hair is so crazy growing up. And there's a couple of times where she refers to herself as ugly and a beast. And it's something that I think a lot of young black girls can kind of resonate with because we grow up in a society or 
at least the vast majority of us grow up in a society where our hair is not accepted and we're not told that our hair is pretty. So I didn't know what my hair texture was until I was, I think, 19 years old. I didn't start liking my hair until I was 21. So until I was 19, I completely hid my hair because I was convinced that it was just like the most hideous thing on the planet. So when she's going through it and she's talking about wanting to relax her hair or having it in braids and stuff like that because she just, she didn't want it to be seen. That's something that like completely destroyed my soul because at that age, when you're a black young girl, you need someone there to tell you that, no, your hair is pretty and you don't have to hide it. And she didn't have that, which was so heartbreaking. So that was one aspect that definitely stood out for me. The other one was kind of, um, I guess it's colorism in a way as well, where they were kind of talking about the difference between a dark skin black person and a light skin black person and how there's kind of like an inferiority complex that comes with being a dark skin black person because when you're lighter, you have a different hair texture and you sometimes have a different figure as well and it's just more desirable to be lighter she talks about it more as well where she's like um you'll see a lot of dark-skinned black people saying how they're like a quarter native or a quarter something else so they're not just black or, or like just black as if that's not good enough and how she also wanted to be like that as well so that was heartbreaking as well but still resonated with me and i think it's topics that i'm happy that she brought up because a lot of the times when you're reading books written by black authors they're talking about such prevalent problems like police brutality or um something along those lines that the things that seem minor or insignificant to others aren't spoken about and here you got a whole kind of worldly view of what happens or what goes through a young black person's mind when they're growing up especially because she went to a predominantly white school those differences are made so so clear and then she had to come back and figure well she doesn't really fit at home because now she's perceived as like, I think, what did Tiffany call her? I think she called her like uppity or bougie or something along those lines, but then you don't really fit in at school because you're not white. And a lot of the stories she goes through saying how she doesn't want to lose Elena because that's really her only friend. So there's a lot of aspects of this book that hit really close to home and it was just really heartbreaking to read, but also really beautiful to read because it's nice to have someone else tell your story and actually know your story, so yeah <laughs> that was a really long spiel i'm sorry <laughs> no that's what i wanted to hear that's what i want to know like what what really resonated because that's tr i totally that's so brilliant that you brought that up the smaller day-to-day -day things that people overlook wow that's, that's not good i just want i don't like i just want to change the world why can't we just like flip a switch like thanos and just be like all right stop this <laughs> like yeah, I hate it. <laughs> got a lot of topics in there. I think the hair was definitely my favorite one because that it's such a simple thing like your hair. You think that, you know, growing up, everybody at least likes their hair. But the reality for a lot of young black girls, we don't start off liking our hair. We have to learn to love our hair. And then for a lot of us as well, you have to learn to love your skin, too, because society doesn't like that either. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did anything stand out with you and your experience, Yesenia, or was it slightly different as well? Well, obviously I can't speak. I'm, I'm Hispanic and I'm Native American, so like I don't know about like right. the black experience, especially in my country or other countries across the world. But um, I did, one thing that stuck out to me too was colorism, because that's rampant in my community as well. Obviously I'm someone who doesn't, <laughs> When you look at me, you don't see that I'm a person of color, but that um, it's on both sides of the spectrum, which is really, really sad because I grew up in Virginia. So I was, I think, like the only Mexican person in my entire school. So I was always pointed out for that. And it's it's almost like everyone else sees you as who you are, which is perfectly fine. But then like within my own community, since I don't have like a darker complexion, I'm not like Hispanic enough, I'm not native enough or whatever the case may be. And it's 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 a really, really sad thing. But um, yeah, that was one thing that I really connected with was just kind of the colorism aspect of it. Mm -hmm. But I'm someone who like, Obviously, like I'm kind of a white passing person of color, so I don't deal with as much as other people in my in other communities of color. But yeah, still, it's it, it is a hard thing to have to deal with. 
But, wow. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much for sharing. I just wish well, that I could just you. listen to your like experiences for this whole thing and just not talk at all because they're really so enlightening and important. And just thank you for discussing it with us. Um, so we're almost at the one hour mark. So we're going to just really quickly power through mothers. And then is this a top shelf read? Um, so let's talk about Echo's mom. What do we think about that uh, relationship? It's definitely complicated, but like, I want to know what you think. I, I loved their relationship as hard as it was. I really liked seeing how they kind of developed on their own, but then came together at the end and they were as much as they didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things. Like you could definitely see the love that her mother had for her and the love that she had for her mother. Yeah. And the rest of the family, but specifically her mom. <laughs> so I agree. I really like the relationship as well. Yeah, I do too. And I think that their similarities are interesting and like, because her mom was a wizard too mm -hmm. in the story. Um, and like she, her mom doesn't want Echo to become a wizard if I'm thinking correctly, right? She, mm -hmm. She's kind of like, no, or like when she sees the signs in Echo, she is like against it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then eventually like she ends up being a big part, I think of, Echo, like, getting used to her wizard powers um, and learning how to deal with them. And I love how all the women in, in, in Echo's life are wizards and help her learn how to be a wizard. Because it, then you can start talking about the importance of mentors, too, and women mentors mm -hmm. in your life. And how they help you deal with being a human in this crazy world. <laughs> I think another thing that really struck me that the... Uh, relationship and her mother, another bad issue that was highlighted is drugs. Um, not just drugs, but alcoholism. Like we have so many uh, things that it prevents people from being able to be what they want to be. Like she kept saying, like, I wanted to be there for you and make sure that what happened to me didn't happen to you, but I couldn't. And she keeps bringing up, you know, the one time where she turned against her was when Echo flushed her uh, drugs down the toilet and um, that was the first time she ever like turned it against her and like um, I've had similar experiences in my life with you know parents that it it makes them a completely different person almost and um, I just that broke my heart when her mom just kept saying like I promise I wouldn't let what happened to me happen to you but it happened anyway and like um, it just, cause I know that that's a coping mechanism for what happened to her. So you, again, like you look at people as humans, that was her trauma that happened to her and the drugs helped her. I can't remember what drugs they were, I'm sorry, but like um, they were what helped her cope and be able to live. <laughs> and that's just is devastating cause now it affects others, but she has to live too. It's just like a big cycle of another traumatic situation that happens to unfortunately so many people and it, added that extra layer because um, like Sarah brought up earlier, you know, like once she tried to get better, she tried, but then, you know, it's not that easy when it's an addiction. You can't just be like, it's usually not a flip of the switch. So um, I just thought like there were so many, the mother was another, there were so many, there's so many subjects that were tackled here that were, I'm honestly surprised. I checked my book and I don't know if yours does, but there's no trigger warnings on this. And I was honestly surprised because no. it's a YA. Yeah. yeah, it's in the YA section of my yeah. library. And I'm like, a teenager would read this without trigger warnings. There's so many powerful, impactful, but devastating subjects that are brought up. And I think the mom covered a lot of those subjects, sadly. I, yeah, that's sad. <laughs> I will say though that I am glad that this is a YA book because I think that honestly so many teens do deal with this thing. Like it's a book that I wish that I would have had when, when I was a teen because I think that it would have helped me put into perspective like the struggles that were going on in my own life while they weren't exactly they I mean they weren't exactly the same as Echoes. They just help I don't know, me feel more understood because I could relate to some of them. 
And I know that so many other people could too. So I'm glad that it's YA. And I think that these books that deal with these really hard topics are so important for the people who are going through the same things. Like they can be life changing. Because a lot of times when you're in a situation like this, you feel alone. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Um, okay. So then to just end our live show, what we always do is we ask the question, is this a top shelf read? And then we just kind of say why. Um, so I can start off and then we'll kind of go in the direction of the, the video. Uh, but I definitely think this is a top shelf read. I think it is by far one of the best YA contemporary books I have ever, ever read. And I could give lots of reasons, but my personal favorite things are how it's framed. So how there are these parallel scenes that just add a complete different layer to the story. And then the magical realism just makes everything that's already so powerful more powerful. So that's why it's a top shelf read for me. I completely agree. If I could give this infinity stars, I would. <laughs> I want to recommend it to anybody who thinks that they can handle the subject matter that's talked about. Um, but yeah, 100%. This is, I can already tell it's going to be one of my favorite books of the year. And I'm so glad that we read it together. And um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I don't think we talked about it that much, but I really enjoyed how at the end of each chapter, there was kind of a lesson on mm -hmm like what she learned from this specific like instance she went through or um, how to become like your own wizard. So mm -hmm. yeah, top shelf, 100%. I agree. I definitely think it was a top shelf read for sure. Um, I would give it like a hundred stars. It was absolutely amazing. <laughs> I think the best part was I went into it not thinking it was going to be this good at all. So um, it was, I was pleasantly surprised about that. My favorite part is definitely being able to have a story that um, in so many ways tells my story, which is really nice, so. Yeah, no. uh, definitely the same. I, like I said, I already tabbed up my library book and now I've got to buy one so I can like do it again. <laughs> like, I, I love it. And I think that I love the lessons as well. It's a really powerful learning tool, but I also love, like I said, you're getting to see multiple ways of life. Cause Elena was from, not, I don't remember. I, it's been a little while since I've read it, but it has, uh, what's his name? What's the one who gets in the accident? Jesse. 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 Yes. Yeah. It's got like perspectives from so many walks of life and, and I feel like so many people can relate to it, but it opens up a dialogue or the opportunity for a dialogue to hear other people's perspectives of what they related to. And you can see, like, I just feel like it's such a great tool to get people sharing their life stories with each other, to get people to see other people's perspectives and to be able to relate to things as well. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, this is definitely a top shelf read. Um, definitely like one of my favorite books of mm -hmm. the year, probably of the last like few years, to be honest. Um, and I think that it was just so well written. Um, I think I will actually read it again, but listen to the audiobook. So, yes, please listen to the audiobook. <laughs> she was great in her TED Talk, so I just want to see her delivery. Yeah, I need to see that <laughs> TED Talk. <laughs> yeah. It was like okay. two. <laughs> Good. Um, so with that, we are going to be bringing our second live show to a close for the Top Shelf Society. First of all, if you have not subscribed to Elle, her channel and Instagram are pinned in the comments below. The very first comment you're going to see, drop everything you're doing and subscribe because if you've seen this, then you know that Elle is amazing. We love her um, and you will too. So yeah, so definitely subscribe. Um, and then also talking about our July live show that is going to be the last Saturday in July. It's July 25th, 5 p.m. I think it's going to be on my channel. If that changes, we'll let you know on our socials. And we are reading The Secret Garden this time. So, yes, we look forward to speaking to you then. Um, don't forget to check out the Black Lives Matter resources in the description box below and also you can follow top shelf on instagram goodreads and twitter all of that is in the description box below too 
But yeah, that's going to be it for now, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.